And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to the show. Of course, it is uh, Monday as we kick off really now the first full trading week of July. It also kicks off earnings season. Of course, we, we always affectionately know that as the millennial earnings season because as we discussed in this weekend's newsletter, analysts have been very busy over the last month cutting estimates for the S&P to make sure that we can get a good beat rate, right? So we can get that 70, 80% beat rate of earnings that we get you know, every, every quarter. Everybody gets a trophy, so it's always good. Um, big difference this time, though, going into this quarter, is estimates are high for companies like NVIDIA. Lots of optimism there that they're going to have just a boomer quarter, and they probably will. I mean, because you know some of the channel checks are certainly very strong for NVIDIA right now in terms of their earnings, but that bar has been set pretty high. So again, to kind of maintain valuation levels, that bar is going to have to remain high for some time to keep justifying that. And that's going to potentially be a challenge in, in, in some future quarters for a company like NVIDIA to keep meeting those high hurdles. But Again, doesn't mean that won't be the case this quarter. And again, that's really kind of been the darling. And NVIDIA has really set the tone for this earnings season. So the thing to be looking out for as we get into earnings season this quarter is going to be companies that either meet or beat those estimates. And not just the estimates on earnings, but also the estimate on sales. So they need to have a double beat. They need to beat on earnings and sales. Now, the, qu the problem is, or I shouldn't say the problem, but the issue is, that the market has already priced in a lot of earnings for these companies. So we may see companies coming in beating lowered earnings estimates on both sales and revenue, uh, sales and earnings, but they may not get well rewarded for that. So you may not expect to see a big surge in stock prices over the course of the next couple of months as we go through earnings season. It'll be more likely to note that earning companies that beat their estimates will probably maintain their current value, maybe move up a little bit, but companies that miss will probably be a bit more punished here than what we saw in the last quarter. So it'll be the miss side of those earnings estimates that will probably be the things to keep a watch out for. But nonetheless, uh, you know, kind of, this is the, the, what we'll be looking at here over the next really two, three, four weeks in particular as we really get into the heart of it. Now, starting this week, we always kick off with the financials. So we'll start to see uh, Chase and uh, J.P. Morgan Chase and Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Those will be the first up. So we'll start to kind of get a first look at kind of what's going on on the lending side of these companies. The thing to look for in banks. Are they increasing loan loss reserves? Are they, are they starting to you know, kind of get a whiff or a sense that there's about to be a pickup in consumer defaults on loans, credit cards, those type of things? And, and so loan loss reserves are where they take some money and they set it aside to offset those losses. Um, that's an expense on the books in the short term. If those loan loss reserves don't get used, they bring them back on as income. So you always have to kind of sort that out when you take a look at their earnings, uh, their earnings announcement. But keep a watch on if they're building those loan loss reserves. That'll tell you if they're starting to see some fracturing in the consumption side of the equation, uh, which of course is, is that big driver for the economy as, as we kind of keep looking out. Now, the other big news was on Friday was the employment report came in at about 209,000. Now, now that was substantially below estimates. That's the first time that the employment number has missed estimates in 14 months. Uh, we've beaten estimates 14 months in a row. This is the first miss. So that streak of outperformance on the employment number is now over. Uh, but there was some pretty significant deterioration in that employment number. And the unemployment rate tends to stay flat about 12 months out before a recession. And it's been flat for about six months. So there is, so again, kind of going back to looking at those bank earnings and, you know, kind of looking at the employment data, look at the unemployment rate. There's still that concern out there that we're going to have a slower economic slash recessionary environment six to nine months from now. So that's still kind of sitting there on the horizon because of this lag effect of higher rates. And, and finally, the, all this liquidity is 
kind of starting to come out of the out of the economy as well. So this is all going to kind of start to pile up potentially over the next six, eight, nine, 12 months, where we may start to see a weaker earnings environment as we get their profits, uh, profits for companies continue to be under pressure. And so we start, we've still still starting to see some of that weakness in the profit side of the equation. Again, we're going to a lot more, we're going to get a lot more sense of this uh, over the next couple of weeks, but those will be the things that we're really looking out for as we start really kicking off earnings season starting this week. Okay, here's what you need to know before the bell. Uh, last week, the markets actually began that sell-off we've been talking about. Uh, we actually, you know, kind of bounced off that 20-day moving average, uh, retested the previous high that we had set earlier, sold back off, sitting right on that 20-day moving average again today. So as the markets open up right now, futures are pointing a little bit lower this morning, basically flattish. We'll see how the market trades uh, trades through the day, but that 20-day moving average, we're sitting right on top of it right now. The market, if it's going to hold this level, needs to hold that today, kind of figure out a reason to rally here. But we're still <clears throat> still on that sell signal. So again, you know, we triggered this sell signal a couple of weeks ago. The market's pretty much, again, as we talked about back then, uh, was either going to have a decline or kind of consolidate sideways. Well, we've been consolidating sideways now for about two weeks. So again, the market's still continuing to hold up here at elevated levels, which is fine. Um, but we've now put in kind of a double top. That 20-day moving average is going to be key support here. If we break that 20-day moving average, we're going to start to look to retest that 50-day moving average. That's going to give you that bit of a correction that we've been looking for potentially this summer uh, to increase equity exposure. But right now, um, the market is still holding that 20-day moving average here. Uh, we're still on a sell signal. That sell signal still at a pretty elevated level, suggesting that we have some more work to do. So again, the market continue could continue to consolidate here sideways, not really do much, maybe move a little bit higher. We could work off that sell signal a bit if that happens, or you're going to get a correction, which will work off that sell signal as well. So, you know, we never know how this is going to work out. We've seen periods before, like we had back in, in uh, April and May, where for 45 days, the market literally just went nowhere, traveled right along that 20-day moving average. Could maybe be starting that process again. We'll see. Don't know yet. To You know, I can't make a prediction here. But the market is starting to work on that 20-day moving average. So it's testing it, retesting it, testing it, retesting it. We'll see if it can hold it here. If not, again, we're going to see some lower prices, which really, you know, with the market up as much as it is this year, wouldn't be surprised, as we've said before, a 3 to 5 to 7 to 10% correction completely normal within any given year. And that would give you a much better opportunity to increase equity exposure you know, at some at some better risk reward entry level. But again, just haven't really gotten a good setup here to increase that exposure. I suspect we'll get one over the next couple of months. Earnings season could be the trigger. We'll find out. But again, just be a little patient here. I know there's kind of this FOMO to jump in and chase things. We you know we want to get in, got to make some money. The market's moving up. I get it. But if you'll be patient, you'll get a better opportunity at some point. Don't know where or when but you will get a better opportunity to increase that equity exposure on a better risk reward basis. So that's what you need to know before the bell this morning. All right, as we come back from the break, we've got a couple of things to get into. Got some economic data to go over. Uh, got some big reports coming out this week as well on some of the economic data. The NFIB survey coming out tomorrow. So that's gonna give us a lot along with inflation data. So we'll get into all that this morning. I'm your host, Lance Roberts. Get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Get our latest newsletter as well. It's on the website now for you. And we'll be right back after the break. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the RIA Mid-Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd. With Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Chief Investment Strategist Lance Roberts. Get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year. Register now for the RIA Mid-Year 
Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show. Of course, it is uh, Monday as we get this really full week of July, first full week of July underway. It's also, as I said earlier, the kickoff of earnings season. And that's really going to be all we're going to be talking about here for the most part over the next you know two to three weeks in particular. Um, by the end of this month, uh, we will have the bulk of the S&P 500 reporting, and, and that will give us a really good kind of feel for – kind of where the economy is again you know it, it, we often kind of get lost as as markets are rallying we kind of forget about this relationship between the markets and the economy and you know it's an important relationship because earnings that we always that we're talking about here is like oh what did what did they earn well it comes from the economy it comes from people being able to go out and spend money and that's why sales at the top line of the income statement are so important. And I've got an uh, article that I'm working on now be coming out um, talking about quarter two earnings and, you know, kind of really what to look for. But, you know, companies have gotten into a really bad, I shouldn't say a bad habit. They've, they've began a, a series of, of things over the last several years, and this is not new of taking action on financial statements to improve the bottom line earnings. And this is the problem with operating earnings. It's, you know, operating earnings are earnings without all the reality in them, right? The things that actually happen to businesses. Operating earnings are earnings X all the bad stuff, right? These are earnings that I would like them to be in a perfect world. Well, the problem is we've got we've become to rely on those operating earnings as some form of reality, and and they're not. Reporting earning reported earnings are a far different story, but even those earnings are now heavily manipulated by accounting gimmicks and fudging, and in some cases, you know, outright manipulation. And none of this is illegal, mind you, but it's not really a fair assessment of what's going on with companies, you know, cookie jarring reserves, you know, offsetting expenses, these type of things, reclassifying expenses as certain other events. You know, these are all types of things that companies can do that make the bottom line earnings look better. And this is why, you know, I say regularly, take a look at what's happening with sales. Sales are what happens at the top line. If I, if I go out and sell a widget to somebody and they pay me a dollar, that's my sale. I can't really do much with that, right? It's, that's my sale. That's, that's, I, I can't increase that sales volume. I can't make $1 magically $2 worth of sales. 
But what I can do is if my normal operating margin is or, or gross margin or cost of goods sold, however you want to classify it, you know, if, if that is normally 80 cents, it takes me 80 cents to build that widget and I sell it, my profit margin's 20 cents. Well, there's a lot of things I can do at the bottom line to make that 20 cents into 30 cents or 40 cents by, uh, you know, changing the way I classify things and, and the way I expense things off of my statement, et cetera. So I can make the bottom line earnings look a whole lot better than what we see on top line. I'll give you a good example of this. Since 2009, and you can do the math yourself, but since 2009, Reported earnings have risen over 500% since 2009. Sales, top line, have increased by 104%. So explain to me this. How can I only increase my sales by 104% from the 2009 lows, but increase my earnings by over 500%? Yes, there's inflation. That means that, you know, things cost more, right? But that also impacts my input cost. So those kind of offset each other. And so the point is, is that no matter what you think about, it's very hard to figure out a way that in a normal operating environment that I can increase my earnings per share by 500% when my sales have only gone up 100%. But this is what happens, right? And a lot of this has to do with share buybacks, corporate share buybacks. And we've talked about that. If I can reduce the number of shares outstanding, and since I report my earnings as earnings per share, if I can reduce the number of shares outstanding, guess what happens to my earnings per share? They go up, right? So if I consistently engage in, in very high levels of stock buybacks, that improves my earnings per share. That, combined with accounting gimmicks, et cetera, makes things look a whole lot better. But again, this, uh, this also goes back to what we're paying for, right, as investors, and, you know, it goes back to the valuation issue, goes back to, you know, what we're paying for, what we should expect to get paid for. But it also goes to the heart of just how profitable are these companies in reality. You know, phantom earnings, we can say, oh, wow, man, the, the, the profit of this company is great. Well, if it's mostly accounting gimmicks, it's not really that profitable. It may look profitable on paper, but it's not profitable in real life. And this is, of course, why and how to, and when we know this is the case, right? Because every time that we get into trouble economically, what's the first thing that happens? We got to go bail out all these companies, right? 2020, we shut down the economy. We have to bail out Boeing. We've got to bail out Norwegian Cruise Lines. We've got to bail out all these companies that were supposedly, prior to shutting down the economy, these companies were making billions of dollars in profits every year. But as soon as the economy gets shut down, it's almost like the average family household that's one month, you know, one paycheck away from bankruptcy. As soon as we shut down the econ economy, they're going, well, we don't have the money. Somebody's got to bail us out. Well, you weren't saving up for a rainy day somewhere? No, they weren't. Boeing was buying back their shares hand over fist for the, the previous five years leading up to the pandemic. They used all their cash buying back shares. So when the, when the economy got shut down and people couldn't fly, all of a sudden they're like, well, you know, I need a bailout. But see, this is how we know that these companies aren't nearly as strong as we think they are. Because as soon as something happens, got to start putting some, together some facility to support them. Regional banks, good example. You know, Banks are constantly passing their Fed stress test, and as soon as something happens, rates go up. Well, we got to bail them out. But wait, higher rates was one of the things you were stress tested against. Higher rates, higher unemployment, you know, you should be able to survive all that. But we've, what we find out is as soon as rates go up, mm, 
they're not as well capitalized as we thought. So we got to put together a facility to bail them out. The point about all this, though, is that as we get into earnings season, this is the stuff to start looking at. When you're investing in a company, look below the headline. It's going to be tempting just to say, oh, they beat earnings. I'm going to buy the stock, right? And it may work for a while, but eventually it's going to play catch up. It can last, but again, these things can and have lasted a lot longer than you would expect them to. So, you know, it's just something to think about. But, you know, the point is, as we get into earnings season, these are the things to be looking for. And, and like I said, I've got a report coming out uh, here soon, really kind of talking about, you know, this in particular as we head into quarter two, kind of what to look out for. But, you know, as we start getting these reports in, we'll spend time here on the show kind of going through some of the numbers and, and talking about, you know, how these are actually looking and just how how strong does the market actually look and it's going to be particularly important now because if the economic data is correct and unemployment is potentially you know going to start to to rise here at some point in the next you know six months or so and you know the 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 you know, inversion of the yield curves and leading economic indicators are still suggesting that we have a recession coming. If a recession is coming, then what these earnings below the surface tell us will tell us how viable these companies will be if a recession hits. Now, we're not talking about them going out of business, right? We're talking about price corrections where markets start to reprice for earnings and profitability. And in some cases, because of the run-up in these stocks since the beginning of the year in particular, there's going to be some fairly meaningful corrections in price to realign those stock prices with their underlying valuations and what they're actually worth. That's the See, that's the thing we want to pay attention to Again, won't matter much this quarter. There's a lot of FOMO. There's a lot of hype right now. People are going to be chasing stocks. But over the next 6, 9, 12 months, if, 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 the big question is the if, if the recession is still out there, that's where it's going to matter. But again, that's a big if. We've been, you know, people were talking about a recession last year. We're like, nope, no recession now. Maybe a recession this year. But that's now been pushed out to next year. And that's because all that monetary input that we put into the economy, it's pushing the stuff out longer than we would have expected. But that's just the way the markets are working right now. But it makes it challenging for managing portfolios. It's just something we got to pay attention to. Okay, we'll come back. Um, got to talk about the inflation data out this week. Also, we have the small business report out tomorrow. We'll get into those numbers coming up next. Don't go away. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the ria mid-year economic review saturday july 22nd with richard rosso danny ratliff and special guest chief investment strategist lance roberts get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year register now for the ria IA Mid-Year Economic Review, Saturday, July 22nd, with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts, realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. 
Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. In 1999, a parafiduciary group of financial advisors were busted by corporate giants for trying to operate in their clients' best interest. These men promptly escaped from a high cost margin environment to the Houston Energy Corridor. Today, still excoriated by their former employers, they survive as protectors of others' fortunes. If you have a problem about preserving capital, if no one else can help, and you can find them right here, maybe you should hire the RIA team. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. I think it's a mistake to shield kids from adversity in life because if you don't expose them to the adversity, then they don't develop the immunity. The Real Investment Show podcast, same show, your schedule. When my kids were growing up, Every time we would hear our neighbor's kids had the flu or the mumps or whatever, we were like, hey, go play with Jimmy. And we sent our kids down there to play with them. At realinvestmentadvice.com. You'd probably have CPS knock on your door these days doing that. Probably. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell Report, plus each day's radio show. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show. So this week, uh, some more market moving data coming out one one won't move the market much at all nobody pays attention to it which is the national federation of independent business report that comes out uh tomorrow uh that's expected to be at 89.9 versus 89.4 and you know while they're expecting to see a slight increase that number is still very recessionary this is another one of those indicators that historically has always you know, been a good leading indicator of the economy. And this is small businesses. And this is just a sampling of the businesses that are non-publicly traded from around the country. They make up about 50% of employment. They're very important to the overall economic environment. These are, you know, your corner barber shops, your nail salons, your local gas stations, you know, all these type of just independent small businesses around the country that employ up to 500 employees. So some of some of these small businesses can be quite large, right? But they have a good pulse. I mean, these are these are the front line, right? So this is, you know, these are the Marines, you know, of the economy. They're the they're, you know, on the front lines, they're the ones dealing with the customers, you know, hand to hand every day. And so when there's a, when these businesses are reporting a slowdown in activity, and they have less visibility about the economy. And they're saying, hey, you know, things aren't as good. You know, sales are slowing down here. Um, you know, we're starting to cut back on employment, whatever it is. Those are all good indicators about what's happening within the economy. So we're going to have that report out this week. Um, those, that data has been showing both a decline in wages, 
right? Um, they were they small businesses were paying up strongly to get employees coming out of the uh, pandemic shutdown because there was a dearth of employees, right? There was just none available. So they, in order to get an employee, they were having to pay more for them. And then, of course, employees were job hopping like crazy at that point because they could go from one job to the next to get, you know, higher wages because everybody just needed employees. Because all of a sudden, you know, we didn't have any product because we shut down the economy, but everybody had money to spend. And so, you know, everybody was having to adopt a delivery type front, uh, you know, Grubhub, whatever it was. They had to, you know, figure out some way to not only deal with customers in their store, but also take advantage of the delivery process as well to get their products to people's houses. So that caused a surge in wages. Those wages now starting to decline here, that wage growth. So that tells you something. Um, you know, their attitude about inflation and you know, sales and those type of things, clearly, you know, their expectations to do capital expenditures, right? So am I going to uh, spend more money to build another store or buy another delivery truck or whatever it is? That rate of capital expenditure is dropping rather sharply. Why? Because their forecast on the economy is not good. They're looking at their sales coming in their door. They're looking at their foot traffic. They're looking at these things going... Um, you know, I'm not sure I want to commit, you know, 60, 70, 80, 100 grand, whatever it is, for a new delivery truck or a new forklift or whatever it is that they need. I'm not willing to commit that capital because I'm not sure the sales are going to be there to support it. And for companies on the smaller end of the scale, these are important decisions. You know, for instance, Apple could go out and, and, and buy, you know, 10 forklifts for their warehouse and it would be like, pfft, you know, that's left pocket change for Apple. They don't care. But for a small business, that can make the difference between being in business or out of business if you spend a bunch of money at the wrong time. So very important decisions here. And if you take a look at some of this data, again, the media doesn't give small businesses much due. Right. They're they're you know, the you know television is more involved with the, the ten thousand mega corporations in the country, which are a very small percentage of the six million businesses that make up the economy that actually have employees. There's thirty some odd million businesses that are registered with the United States, only about six million have have employees, right? The rest of them are employee less. But those 6 million are very important, but we only focus on the 10,000 or so that are the Apples, the Googles, the, you know, the JP Morgans. You know, those are the guys that we focus on, right? It's like, what are they telling us about the economy? But they're not really, you know, yes, they're a very important part of the economy. Yes, they do. And they employ a lot of people. But there's a whole big chunk of businesses out there that, that run this economy that we don't pay attention to at all. Well, the National Federation of Independent Business does. And it's, and it's data well worth looking at. I write a report on it on our website, um, you know, about every quarter or so as the data kind of comes in because it's very important. It tells us, it gives us a good leading indicator about the economy and where it's going. And right now, that data is not great. But the market's ignored all that data up to this point because of the NVIDIAs of the world. And, you know, so we're kind of getting distracted, as I was saying in the last segment. You know, earnings will probably be fairly decent this quarter. We've lowered estimates enough for everybody to beat them. And we're getting distracted by these public companies. We're going to look, look, like, look, look over this nice, shiny, you know, toy over here. This is doing great. But this National Federation of Independent Business report out tomorrow will give us a good view about what's really happening. And, and what we're looking for is we're looking for signs of improvement, Right. If, if, the, if the index improves from 89.4 to 89.9, which is expected, that's great. It's still at a very recessionary level, but it's improving, right? So are we starting to see the trough of economic weakness now getting behind us? Or is there still more coming, right? That's what we're looking for in this data. And, we'll, and again, we'll take a look at it tomorrow. Um, also coming out this week is the next CPI report. 
there is an interesting thing that is about to happen with CPI. Remember, and we've talked about this before in regards to inflation, is that we measure inflation on a year-over-year basis. So what was the, the inflation rate last year? What's the inflation rate one year later? So just, you know, very simple math here for everybody. If the inflation number was 100 last year, not the inflation rate, right? That's what we're, that's what we're going to get to, right? How do we derive the inflation rate? So we look at the index. If the index was 100, now we're going to be looking at, you know, we're into July, so we're about to see the June data. So if a year ago of June, the index was at 100, and this year the index is at 104, the inflation rate on a year-over-year basis is 4%. Okay? So that's the, and so we look at that number, right? And, and we say, okay, well, what was the inflation rate last year versus this year, et cetera? And that's how we get the inflation rate. So then we go, okay, so CPI was 4%, you know, last year. We're getting into the point to where we're getting past those big inflation numbers. Last year in May and June, we were talking about 1.2%. 1.4% inflation rates in the month. And so those were big monthly numbers of inflation. Now those inflation numbers are dropping back down very rapidly to where we're now going back to comparing year-over-year -year inflation rates of 0.1, 0.2, 0 0.3. And those are going to continue to go down as we get further into this year. Now, if we just run inflation and we say look let's just assume that going out over the next 12 months that inflation is going to rise at 0.2 percent annualized for the next 12 months inflation will actually start to rise the inflation rate will start to rise if we begin to just print a steady 0.2 percent every month in inflation. And inflation normally runs at about 0.2% per, a month. It's, you know, and that's the number we, you know, we get CPI report, we go the month over month rate of change was 0.2%. The year over year inflation rate is 4%. So when we get those month over month changes, if those month over month changes stay at 0.2%, the year-over-year -year inflation rate is going to start to rise, and all of a sudden, the Fed's going to have a problem. And this is the one thing that nobody's really focusing on just yet, is that the Fed has already been talking about potentially having to hike rates two more times this year, but if the inflation rate actually starts to rise, they've got a real problem. And the markets are going to have a problem because the markets have been betting on a rate cut as early as the beginning of, of next year. Now remember, they were they were now remember the markets early this year in January were expecting rate cuts by June, and now we're out to January of next year. But if inflation actually starts to creep up here, we're gonna be talking about pushing that rate cut way out there. And that could be a problem, one of the problems for the markets. Something to pay attention to. So that that inflation number that we get out this month is going to be very important, and we'll, we'll certainly cover it here on the show. But when we get it out this week, that's going to be something very telling for the markets. And if it's stronger than expected, um, that could take some of the wind out of the market here short term. So that'll be a number we're paying attention to. Okay, quick break. We'll come back, wrap up the show. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Declare your financial independence and prepare for the second half of 2023 with the RIA Mid-Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd with Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff, and special guest Chief Investment Strategist Lance Roberts. Get our report card for the market so far and what you need to know to invest profitably for the rest of the year. Register now for the RIA Mid-Year Economic Review. Saturday, July 22nd with Ratliff, Rosso, and Roberts. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com The Real Investment Show You know, you just have to be so careful what you say these days. Everybody gets so offended so easily. My wife, this weekend, we were taking a little vacation. She asked me, she goes, she she asked me, she goes, am I the only one you've ever been with? And I said, no, I've been with some eights and nines. And that's when the fight started. So, (laughs) just joking. (laughs) I think I think she's home listening this morning. She was not feeling well. So, <laughs> how was the couch this weekend? <laughs> it was fine. Actually, we uh, the whole family uh, we went up to uh, uh, Lake Austin or Lake Travis. Sorry, in Austin, Lake Travis in Austin, and just uh, kind of just hung out on the lake for the a couple of days. All, all, all my kids are, you know, they can, they were in between session breaks for college, so they all brought their you know boyfriends, girlfriends, etc. So. We just kind of hung out for a couple of days and and uh, relaxed a bit. It was it was it was interesting because you know we were sitting around tables and talking about you know when we were growing up and you know versus when they're growing up and the things we used to do and things that we got away with <laughs> growing up. <laughs> you know, and it's just and, and for them it was just kind of interesting because you know they've very had you know our, you know kids have had a pretty sheltered life you know for the most part. Versus where we were growing up and we would like, you know, we were telling our kids, you know, there used to be a commercial that came on every night at 10 o'clock that would ask parents where their kids were. 10 o'clock, it would come on. Do you know where your kids are? Our parents didn't, our parents forgot about us half the time. They were like, oh, we have kids? You know, it's just like, get out of the house. Don't come home till the street lights come on. And at 10 o'clock, they had to be reminded they actually had kids somewhere. So, you know. That's just not the case these days. Anyway, it was just we had a good time and it was it was interesting. So, um, okay, Bud Light booted out of the top ten list of most popular beers. That's what you get when you make a mistake, and you have a choice to fix it or not. Um, interesting headlines this morning. So, as I was saying, there's you know a lot of bullish attitude out there about the markets right now. All right, FOMO's clearly back in the markets. No doubt about it. And the markets have become, you know, increasingly concentrated. We've talked about, you know, the top 10 stocks versus the bottom 490 stocks. 
And if you take a look at the breakdown of the return of earnings, sorry, let me break that. Let me back that up. I said that incorrectly. If you look at the breakdown of the return of the market between the top 10 stocks and the bottom 490, if you own anything other than the top 10 stocks, you're not performing with the markets this year. That performance gap is enormous. It was interesting because there's quite a, a few articles out there that are talking kind of, you know, this more bullish kind of attitude of the markets. And investors have become increasingly concentrated in fewer stocks in their portfolios. At Vanguard, one-fifth of investors 85 or older have nearly all their money in stocks. That is up from 16% in 2012. So one-fifth of all investors 85 or older have almost entirely all of their money in stocks versus 16% in 2012. Now, at 85... That's a lot of risk to take as an individual. But because of what we've done to the markets over the last 10 years in particular, because of zero rates, you know, we have forced individuals to take on exceedingly more risk to get some yield off their money to live on, right? So this is why we've seen this whole push for you know, buying junk bonds and buying high yield dividend stocks, these type of things to create some type of income on their money. But we've now forced individuals into a very high level of risk. And we've taught them that this is okay because the Fed's always going to have your back. Problem is that the Fed's not there right now. And the Fed's caught between a very tough spot between inflation and the markets, if for some reason the market crashed 10, 20, 30, 40% next month, it's not a guarantee the Fed's going to come rushing in with a whole big round of quantitative easing because they're still combating inflation. And if they come in and start dropping tons of money into the markets to try to bail out the markets, they're going to spark a massive inflation surge, which is the last thing they want to do. So investors are very complacent that the Fed's going to come to the rescue, but that may not actually be the case. Here's another headline. Earnings contribution of the top 10 stocks in the S&P 500 has collapsed while their percentage of market capitalization has rocketed past all-time highs. In other words, the earnings don't support the valuations and the prices of these companies. Except for one stock, NVIDIA. But everybody's assuming that what's happening with NVIDIA is going to happen with everybody, right? NVIDIA is just leading the charge, but that's not actually been the case. And again, this is once we get into earnings season, we're going to get a much better picture of this, and that's where potentially a, a little bit of risk to the market comes in. But... You know, that certainly, you know, none of this is held back in, th in investor enthusiasm at all. In fact, tech stocks have the highest relative sentiment in 23 years. In fact, that relative sentiment is now higher in tech stocks today than it was at the peak of the dot com bubble. Now, I'm not saying there's about to be another dot-com bust. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that the, the relative enthusiasm on technology stocks is at a historically high level. And remember, just last year in October, everybody thought FANG stocks were dead. So you went from relative depression in tech stocks to relative enthusiasm in tech stocks in less than a year. And that's a pretty dynamic shift. And of course, normally that enthusiasm can't stay at these levels indefinitely. You're going to have a reversion. Of course, the yield curve that we've talked about 
more often than not, certainly doesn't support this. In 100 years of yield curves and versions, and particularly if you take a look at the 10-year and three-month, which is the Fed's favorite, but the 10-year, two-year in particular, there's only been three inverted yield curves before where they've been this deep. And it was 1929, 1973, and 1979, 80. None of those ended well for the markets. Now, again, not saying that's going to be the case this time. All we can do is look back in history and say, when was the last time the old curves were this inverted? And there's only been three other periods, and none of those worked out well. Again, those times are different than this time. This time is never the same as last time. But there's certainly, given the overall enthusiasm of the markets, the positioning, the relative chase in a handful of stocks, etc., it certainly seems that there is a rising level of risk that investors are taking on that they may be unaware of. So, again, not telling you to go out and panic and sell everything, but I think it's important that in the midst of what we have going on right now and the relative enthusiasm of the market, as I said you know, earlier on the show this morning, this is one of those times where you're going, man, I got to get in. I'm missing the boat. And this is one of those times where you've almost got to step back and say, you know what? I missed that boat, but another boat's going to come into dock here pretty soon. I'll just wait. And you may have to wait a while, right? Could be two months, could be three months, could be six months. But odds are, even, even if the market runs up from here and then pulls back to where we are right now, and you buy at the same level four months from now as you are today, it'll be a better risk-reward opportunity because we'll have worked off some of that overbought condition, some of that deviation from longer-term means, etc. You'll buy at the same level, but your entry point will be better. And I know that's kind of hard to do. Well, I'll just buy here. Well, if I buy here and it runs up and you don't sell, then you just wind up right where you are four, five, six months from now with zero. And if you just kept your money in cash, you're getting 5% while you're waiting. You know, it's always about measuring risk and reward when we invest. And, and right now, it is very hard to suggest that the risk reward is in your favor. Markets are trying to go through a correction. We'll see what happens today. Uh, again, as I said earlier, the market's continuing to kind of hold that 20-day moving average. We just kind of set a double top here over the last, you know, couple of weeks. You know, it kind of looks toppy here at the moment. But doesn't mean this market can't take off and, and run higher. But again, it's just that risk reward level for entry here is just not appealing at the moment. But, you know, you just have to manage accordingly and try to navigate the markets as best you can. If you need help, of course, get by the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Since your questions, your comments, emails, our latest newsletter is out. Uh, it was a short newsletter this weekend because I was traveling. I was on a laptop. I couldn't get all of my charts and graphs. Um, but I will have the full newsletter out this upcoming weekend. So make sure you're subscribed to the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Also, our daily market commentary as well, three minutes on markets and money. That's all. That's before the bell. Um, and this radio show, please subscribe. Um, we get you lots of stuff out every day to help make sure you're managing your money better. realinvestmentadvice.com. <laughs>